welcome to Learn to Live Stress-Free. This is Christine Wright with Dr. Robert Wright, Jr., your go-to wellness coaches of StressFreeNow.info. Today we are pleased to bring you a joint podcast in collaboration with our friend and colleague, Alan Eisenberg, founder of Bullying Recovery and host of Healthy University Podcast. Great. So, Alan, it's so great to have you in the conversation again. We're always grateful when you can come and be on our show and we can be on your show. And this is a wonderful thing that has happened where we are of course, uh, promoting one another's show. You know, you do Healthy University, and we do Learn to Live Stress-Free, and we are both cross-promoting. And so uh, that is very good for us and for our listeners, and respectively. Mm -hmm. So welcome, and it's good to have you back. Well, thanks, and welcome to my show at the same time. It's kind of funny like that. But no, I'm I'm thrilled to be talking to you guys. Uh, You know, Bob and Christine, I think we've We've developed such a good repertoire. I just had uh, another repeat guest on, and I was saying the same thing, which is it becomes almost like talking to friends instead of interviews, and and I think the conversation goes a lot smoother, and I really, really enjoy that aspect because I think I've told you before, I, I see sort of my podcasting as my therapy, <laughs> so, so I need to do well, it. We- we enjoy the conversations too, Alan, and I think so much information comes out of it because we learn from each other every time, so mm-hmm. I know both our audiences are learning too. Yeah, and, and I think today's conversation, what I, what I really wanted to talk about, and I know you all as, as Stress Free Now and the Stress Doctors really focus on, is I had a chance to present in front of my company recently about stress, and as I looked at as I was doing the research and doing the work, I, I guess I never really saw stress as the gateway illness to a lot of both mental and physiological illnesses. And I found out it really is. It's, you know, I think we were talking about it, but I found this interesting fact out that the AMA says that stress is recognized as the number one proxy killer disease today and that it's the cause of more than 60% of all human illnesses and disease. And I was shocked, you know, just dumbfounded by that. Well, Alan, I just want to jump in here and say, you know, I've, I've written actually written a series of articles, and um, in my lead, um, either my lead sentence or in the first paragraph, I talk about that the Centers for Disease Control have said that stress and stress burnout are America's number one health challenge. In fact, I just wrote mm-hmm. an article for addictionblog.org where I mentioned that statistic and so uh it's no surprise to us and and you know ask anyone who has hit the stress burnout wall or is approaching it that extreme exhaustion fatigue and whatever it is stress is no joke and it can take you out and alan eisenberg was wonderful enough to be on the the tail end of a interview with laura stewart who's another wonderful person we were talking about stress And it's really clear that this issue of elder care uh, is is a good example of where stress burnout can get out of control because we personally know, anecdotally, the literature supports this, that sometimes the caregiver is predeceasing the person who they're caring for. And we personally know several cases, uh, in fact, a couple people live on our street, where the caregiver in the neighborhood passed away before the people who who were extremely ill, you know, either had a stroke or, you know, serious fall. And it's the caregiver that predeceases the person. And you could actually see the stress as it was building up. And so, Alan, I'm glad that you're bringing this issue to the fore. So tell us more uh, about your perspective. Well, you know, just to tail on to what you said, Bob, I'm so just unfortunately, like her son has muscular dystrophy and is is going to die. I mean, and she, I'm more worried about her going through these high emotions and high stress because really I, I do believe, you know, we, we were also talking, I know you were talking before, you know, about how, chemical imbalance can cause depression as well or anxiety or, you know, so 
So that's when I really started to find out was that, like I said, stress is really a gateway. And from there, you, you, end, you end up, if you don't handle it, uh, snowballing. And that's scary to the point where you're right. I think it can lead to, you know, death from, from the amount of stress that you put on your body, which, you know, we, we, we just don't think of stress affecting our physiological selves as much as, as equally as our psychological selves. But I did find that to be true in, in my studies. In fact, I think it was looking at one that was 2015 survey of 49% of men and 53% of women said they felt con- constant stress, constant stress. And then and the younger people, it's actually rising. So that that is pretty staggering numbers, I imagine. It is, and I think there's something else that goes on when people are stressed. People may use the word, I'm stressed, but they're not realizing the full import and the impact on their health. And there are some other people who keep going merrily along, doing what they're doing, not getting enough sleep, not eating properly, and being worried or concerned about a job issue, about finances, about their health or someone else's health, and not realize the toll that it's taking on them. Because sometimes it does take someone else to say to you, hey, you've lost 10 pounds, or hey, you look really tired. You've got, you're really short-tempered. Something's wrong here. Sometimes people get into a state and they don't accept it or fully realize it until someone else flags them. Right. Thank you, Christine, for bringing that up, because my own story of stress burnout in the in the early 1980s, I had lost 40 pounds, and I was not aware of it. And it was only because I was putting on my shirt and tie one day, and, and I was saying, what is wrong, you know, with my tie? Why isn't my tie fitting? And, and uh, you know, I was hospitalized shortly thereafter, but I did not have any awareness, and no one said anything to me, that I had lost 40 pounds. That's why my shirt wasn't fitting right with my tie. And so that's an important point that Christine is making, that sometimes we need an outside person, like a, a friend that hasn't seen you in a long time or, or you know, a family member to, to actually say, hey, gee, I noticed that you gained 40 pounds or you notice that you lost yeah. 40 pounds or I noticed that, you know, something's really different. And with them saying it, bringing it to your attention, it needs to be brought to conscious awareness. And I think that that's a big part of dealing with the stress and anxiety uh, equation, even the pain equation, because stress, anxiety, and pain are all linked. And so sometimes, like, for example, we may have a pain like back pain or neck pain, you know, I think if you ask the 100 random people, uh, do you have, do, does anybody in the room have neck or back pain? I think a fair percentage of people would raise their hand. And then if you ask the question a little differently, has have you ever had neck or back pain, <laughs> then, yeah. then it's way over 50%. And so the stress part of it, um, I think anybody knows, uh, Alan, that if you have pain and then somebody aggravates you, I mean, like says or does something that makes you angry or, you know, Christine doesn't like when I use this word, but um, it, they piss you off. We we have a good friend, Alan, I think you, you know who I'm talking about, Dr. Joe Asirio, he uses a phrase, he says, when they get up in your grill, <laughs> right? Wow. And I remember the first time I heard that, I said, that's a real New York phrase, get up under your grill. And, and so, it seems to resonate with, with people very well. Yeah, everybody seems to get that when, they, when you say that. It doesn't matter if the person cut you off on the road and you're trying yeah. to prevent uh, road rage or if you're in a meeting and the person does something or it could be a family context, uh, like it could be Thanksgiving dinner or, or Christmas dinner, and something happens and the person is up in your face. And those right. kind of things, you know, we, we want to, of course, have good outcomes. And Joe uh, has a good strategy, which is that you have to be able to walk away and keep sight of 
what's the real point here where I'm allowing this person to have this control over me? And then the last thing I'll say is that, you know, my daughter, Anthea, she has a great phrase, which I thought that um, she used that she said um, that when something happens, she said, she says, oh, they're trying to rent space in my brain, <laughs> right? <laughs> they're actually renting out space when you get fixated on, you know, how you were wronged. And so I think it's really important to stay focused on what is it that I'm here to do today and what do I want to accomplish? And, you know, we've come across people who tell us that are very successful, say, at the end of the day, I have a list of five things or six things, and I just stay focused on getting those things done, and I don't allow these other distractions. And so when somebody makes you angry or, you know, where you feel wrong, it can sidetrack you in a way that's not just stressful, but it steers you away from accomplishing, you know, your, your getting your goal list done. Well, you, you hit on two really interesting things for me, Bob, because I think you and I share a trait in stress, which is we don't eat. We, we get a stomach ache of some sort or our stomachs tighten or something, you know, where uh, nutrition becomes an issue. And then there's people who are the polar opposites where they eat when they're stressed. And I always think that that's interesting. It's very hard to say, okay, well, one person's not eating and the other person's eating a, a whole thing of Ben and Jerry's ice cream. And it's really all due to stress, and one handles it one way and one handles it another way. And where where I see it all starting from, which is really the interesting part, and I'd, I'd really love to hear your perspective on this, is humans have a real difficulty understanding that at the end of the day we're animals. And animals have a fight, flight, or freeze aspect to themselves, which we call stress, Right. And that's a stress response, right? You're in a situation and all of a sudden this stressor is is brought on to you, whether it's at a meeting or whatever it is. And this reaction, this internal reaction, which all animals have, comes up. Except we're human. We, We can do exactly what you said, is try to learn to cope and handle it differently than what the instinct is telling us to do, which is either fight or flight. Or, or be stuck and freeze, uh, which is another dangerous area, I think. But you mostly hear fight or flight. And it really is. It's an instinctual thing in your body to, that does it. And you have to, at that point, learn how to basically deal with this instinct, instinctual reaction that you watch other animals and they, you know, I have two cats and I never see them because... They have the worst fight or flight problem I've ever seen. Yeah, is flee every time, no matter what. Like 14 years later, I feed on my, I pet them, I do everything, and at some point they're going to run away and just be scared. And I'm like, what is wrong with you cats? But it really is. For, I, I look at it as almost they're them having a broken fight or flight response, which which I've talked about of having a broken fight or flight after being abused for long period of time, I saw everything as a threat, and that threat puts you into fight-or-flight mode. And uh, it took me a long time to get past that. Right, and the thing with the fear response is that it's not necessarily a huge crisis that brings it on. It could be something relatively small, but we're not perceiving it that way. And we get into one of those three modes which stops us from moving ahead. We can't, a a promotion, for example, you've got this promotion, it's seen as a threat, and you're not going to take it because if you do this, then this will happen. And that's Mm -hmm. really a way where we stop our own good many times. Many people, they've been in bad relationships, all of a sudden a good relationship comes along and they don't know what to do with it, they're confused by it, and they fall into one of the fight, flight, or freeze responses And they don't go forward with a perfectly good relationship. So it may not necessarily be, you know, a terrible thing. It could be a good thing, but we still have that fear response that um, somehow interrupts our good. And a lot of this 
has to do with recognizing and really knowing ourselves and understanding. And it's very helpful if we're in a good setting where we have a support system, whether it's a doctor, a family member, a friend, a, a coach, as, as we are, that someone and flags you and says, hey, what's going on here? This is harmful. Why do you keep doing this harmful thing? Or this is good. Why are you resisting this good thing? And all those things contributes to our stress, but a lot of it is recognizing it so we can get to, and hopefully for those who have been listening to our shows, that you've been just lining up those protocols that you can use, whether it's meditation, whether it's yoga, whether it's open focus, something to maintain your equilibrium and your homeostasis that you you know you need to, you know, sort of get off this treadmill of just being forever stressed and anxious. Well, Alan, uh, thank you for that question. I want to do an emerald here where he says he, I want to kick it up a notch. I want to answer your question in three different ways. The first uh, way is uh, the way of Christine. Uh, Christine reminds me that, you know, whenever something threatening or bad happens, that to stay focused on the solution, and she uses the phrase, okay, it's almost like the, the James Bond thing where he says, let's, let's get out in front of this thing, right? Which is like, how do we stay on the cause side of the equation? So I think when you shift to thinking about, okay, this thing just happened. Let's say the person just got fired, right? And right. so if you, if you stay in the state of focusing on, well, I was wrong. I came in on, on Saturdays and Sundays. You know, uh, I, didn't, I didn't go to my kid's soccer game, and then they fired me wrongfully. If you stay focused on that rather than saying, oh, okay, so now what? And what, what are the action steps I'm going to take, which is, which is to move you to where you want to be? You know, maybe this is the time where you start your own business or you move across the country or out of the country or whatever, it jump starts you, but the issue is is that you stay focused on solutions, workable solutions that are practical. So that's my first thing to, to, to keep the stress level at bay is what you know, like what Christine will say to me, she says, Okay, so X happened so what so so now what 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 is your strategy for staying on the cause side of the equation? The second approach to minimizing the stress is to use uh, an NLP approach, which is to think of what's happening, regardless of what's happening is that if you think of states of being as like a seesaw, you have, you're either in a resourceful state or a non-resourceful state. And then so to think of it like if you're in an argument and you're in a non-resourceful state, all of us knows what that is. That's that person that can't be reasoned with. You know, like you're like, you're being unreasonable. You know, yes, yes. And because they're in an unresourceful state, no matter what you say, it's irrational, it's illogical, it's, it's, sometimes it's stupid, right? As, let's be honest. You know, many people do dumb stuff, right? And it wasn't it that that movie, it was Dumb and Dumber? And it's actually, uh, I can't, uh, you know, someone brought this issue of uh, the Darwin Award <laughs> to my attention. Yeah. So don't go there. And Alan, I want to thank you because you brought the um, the issue of the movie Idiocracy to my um, right. uh, um, attention about 18 months ago, and I and that certainly shifted me. Um, I remember when I saw the trailer, I, I think I could only watch about four minutes of it because it just was so awful, but it actually shifted me, and now I've actually desensitized myself to it and say, hey, listen, pay attention here differently. So what I'm saying from an NLP standpoint that we can reframe Whatever is happening to us more easily, especially if we stay in a resourceful state, stay mm -hmm. in a, a place of resourcefulness, and so you're on the road and um, the third person has cut you off, you missed your light, you're going to be late for your, not just your meeting, you're the speaker. And so if you let that kind of thing get to you, it can burn you up. Or you can uh, pull the car over and dial in and, and work something out instead of, jumping out of the car and, you know, um, chasing <laughs> the right. person who cut you off. And so that's, that's the second thing. And the third thing is something that Christine mentioned briefly here. Open focus is, is an excellent way, you know, you know, MBSR has become, mindfulness-based meditation has become a rage. 
and especially in the corporate setting, but open focus actually is much simpler and much easier to do and implement. And so what, with open focus, um, you learn to pay attention to how you're paying attention. And so yep. when something bad happens to us, I'm putting quote-unquote whatever bad is, you, you shift your attention from a narrow um, basis to a, a broader basis. And then I actually just thought of a, a fourth thing, because when you shift your attention, it makes it the stress will automatically begin to dissolve once you broaden your attention. And the last thing that I thought of for our listeners is is something that Hans, um, not just Hans Selye, but um, Viktor Frankl talked about, you know, man's, in his book, Man's Search for Meaning, that sometimes when bad stuff happens to good people, by searching for meaning, it can be helpful in terms of recalibrating the, the stress response. If you think about like um, an antelope that's almost that had a close call with a lion or a tiger or some other predator, um, you'll notice that antelope will have a brief period of shaking and it'll shake off that mm-hmm. kind of thing. But we as human beings tend not to have more have more difficulty shaking it off. But that's really what we're talking about is and, and that's actually what the grief response does when it works properly. It re it shakes things off and recalibrates the system, giving us a second opportunity. And so uh I know that was a long winded way of answering your question, but those are four solution, cause-based um, action, uh, practical things that we can do to shift out of the stress where instead of the tail wagging the dog, we decide when to wag the tail and not let the stress get the better of us. It's interesting that you, um, you bring up two things that, that uh, I kind of learned as well, which one is this really interesting technique, and it works for very well for anxiety, for people with anxiety, if they can learn to do it, which is to try to do exactly what you were saying, which is become a third party to what's happening to you, because what's happening to you is not in your control. So you're having an anxiety attack, and if you can stop at that moment and kind of come in third person and go, hmm, that's interesting. Why, why is my body reacting this way? Why, why am I having this attack right now? What's, what's causing it? And, and instead of falling into allowing it to mentally take you down, you actually play third party to it. And it actually is a very, a very good technique, uh, an excellent one um, that, that I've learned to do uh, and I just did recently because I'm, I'm no different than anyone else. Things make me anxious sometimes. I said, hmm, what, what's making me anxious about this situation? I traveled abroad, and I don't travel abroad that much. And, and it, the first day, I just felt very an- anxious. And I said, hmm, you know, it's probably just this change, lack of sleep, these things. And, you know, the rest of the trip was great. You know, we did we did 11 days, and it was it was wonderful. You know, it was just I needed to get past that that little bit. Um, But it's when you let it haunt you. You know, when I used to let it haunt me, oh, this happened to me, and now I'm afraid it's going to happen again and again and again, that I ran into a a problem. The the other part that's really, really fascinating to me and that people don't think about is, and I think when you talk about NLP, this is how sometimes I think about it, is, is that we don't, we tend to think of life as one long process. We have a beginning, birth, a middle, sort of middle age, and an end, right, our death. And, and those are the guarantees of life is that you're going to have a birth and a death and, of course, is, and Franklin said taxes. Um, but for me, I found that my story can be thought of in little segments of beginnings and endings beginnings, middles, and endings. And all my life is built around lots and lots of beginnings, middles, and endings. And when you let something end, when I let something end, and then I can start a new beginning. And so even if it wasn't in my plan, i.e. losing my job or something happens or whatever, I can adjust to start my new beginning. 
and that's that was huge for me. That that little bit of of thinking and not thinking of life as sort of this big beginning, middle, and end. And once it gets disrupted, oh, this thing happened to me, as you know, you know, mine was bullying. This thing happened to me in my youth, and it's haunted, haunt, haunting me forever. Once I gave that up and said, well, that story's over, and it's been over a long time, and look at all the stuff I've done since then, I was able to move on. And I think that's that's a big part of the story for maybe somebody in the audience or a lot of people is we don't allow ourselves to move on. We don't allow ourselves because, like you said, you know, other animals shake it off, and then they don't have the brain capacity to remember it. It disappears, you know, it's like... It, you know, they they say you know an animal, you know how long it can think of the past is so uniquely small that you know they they've forgotten about it by the time you know it's almost over. And for us, we we have the capacity to remember and remember and remember, and that's the part that gets us. Right, and I think that's something, Alan. You bring up um, a few things here that I'd like to comment on. This idea of remembering. I think it has to do with different um, personalities, too. There are some people who can genuinely let something go immediately, and then there are others of us who hold on to it and relive it and ruminate about it, and that can really take us down. What you said about when you traveled, you mentioned the solution. You noticed it. You said you were anxious, and you noticed you were anxious, and you asked, what is it, um, uh, what am I anxious about? And I think when we're able to do that, that's when we can really help ourselves heal, is to notice in the moment, and then we yeah. can do something about it. But when yeah. when we sweep it under the rug or it keeps going on and on and on, and we're not flagging ourselves and no one else is flagging ourselves, that's, I think, when we really build our anxiety, our depression, our stress, our pain, when it's not interrupted by by the noticing of it so that we can shift it. Yeah, I, d- I definitely uh, think that that's true. And and it is that we need those interrupters. I, th- I think it's Malcolm Gladwell talks about interrupters a lot, but how how we need those things to happen. You know, change happens when things are interrupted. And we we have to realize that that's on a good and bad side. You know, the other the other. The other thinking point I've made for myself is to believe that there's an equality to happiness and sadness and tough days and good days and everything else. It's not, you know, so so I, li- I live with contentment. I don't live with happiness or sadness. I live with the idea that I'm content. Uh, and then if I can reach contentment every day, which is sort of an equality, and, and you know, hey, if I can be 55% happy and 45% sad, I'm doing better than average, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, that's one right. way to look at it. Alan, I just want to jump in here since you mentioned Malcolm Gladwell. Um, I believe it was last year sometime uh, I heard a uh, actually a podcast broadcast that uh, he had done. Uh, I don't remember the show. Malcolm Gladwell was talking about how um, this concept of his 10,000 hours to become an expert kind of took off and went viral. He was saying that actually was not the intention of his book, and that was just like a minor thing. And so he was more surprised than anyone else that <laughs> that that's what they were saying. Well, Malcolm Gladwell is saying this, but he, he did say that, but he was saying that wasn't the point of his book. And so I just want to mention that. And then I think this issue of reframing, I know what I have felt helpful is that when something happens, is that the, and, and the NLP technique is to shrink it down. So the, the thing that I use is um, I think of Mel- Nelson Mandela. Here was this guy who was unfairly um, in prison for 27 years, and then he came out and became president of the, the country. And so... And then I just look at uh, saying, okay, what is it that I'm dealing with right now compared to what Nelson Mandela had to deal with? I also uh, use something else, which is that my grandmother, my maternal grandmother, used to walk 12 miles barefoot to work one, one way. 
And I remember being in South Carolina, and I was an adult. I think this was maybe 10 or 15 years ago. They were showing me the path that she took, and I said she could not have possibly walked that far. They said, yeah, she used to walk this far every day each way. It was about 12 miles. And so I keep that in perspective whenever something, some unfairness or whatever is happening, that it it automatically shrinks it down because uh, regardless of the level of it, I compare it to, you know, these people that went before me, what did they deal with? The person yeah. before there was a law, you couldn't fire somebody, you know, for failing, you know, but then now there is, at least there is. And so, so there is some degree of progress. So I, I keep that in mind. That that tends to help me. But as you're indicating, by making it not the entire story, by um, chunking down, if you will, and making it just a chunk of the story, okay, so there's 24 hours in a day. This happened for, for 35 minutes. This is really bad. This is, I don't really want this, but it's only 35 minutes of a 24-hour period. And so so this is what we're really talking about is being able to stay calm and keep perspective. And I, I think that, that when you do that, you tend to have better outcomes. Of course, it's like what Christine and I, we talk about this all the time. If you walk down a street and you fall into the hole and then you get out of the hole, the point is don't keep going down that same street. Because there's a hole right. in that street, you know, right. take another street. And so sometimes I joke with Christine and I say, you know, I'm, I'm going down a different street because I don't want to go down that street. And so that becomes the issue. Uh, human beings uh, tend to have habits. And so if you have a habit that gets you into trouble, you, you have to choose, which is that, okay, so I've got this. This is something like, you know, people are facing like with addiction, Right. So I'm just using that as an easy example, but there are many other examples. So the person uh, is dealing with their addiction, they go into recovery, and then for some people there's a loss of a global uh, sense or collapse of identity because the person that they were before, even though now they've gotten rid of the physical craving, um, there's still the psychological component. And so the issue is that they can't, you know, as a person said to me, they said, oh, I've been in recovery for six months, but I'm going into the bar to get lunch. And I said, no, you can't do that. Then why don't you, so what they said, well, it's on my way home. I said, well, then take a different path home because the point is that level of familiarity is just a matter of time before you would fall back into that groove because that's how the, the brain works. Our nervous system it has a series of grooves. And so, you you know, almost like a digital tape or even like the old, um, Alan, you're old enough to remember when we had audio tapes, right, and that you could erase oh, yeah, them yeah. or record over that. So that's what you're doing with the brain. Um, memory patterns is that recording over and you do it over and over until you can change the pattern. And so for some people that's harder than others and depends on what type of habit you're trying to break. But in right. any event, to, to collapse this down, the bottom line is it, it still comes down to choice. To lay it on top of that, when you're stressed out, making good choices is more difficult because in a stressful situation, the blood flows to the left hemisphere, if you're a right-handed person, it are reduced. And so the chances that you're going to make a good prefrontal executive cortex decision is reduced. So the thing is, is that, you know, like the kindergarten teacher would tell you, is, you know, stay out of trouble as much as you can. But when you do get into things, is to have some kind of system for how you're going to make a decision and then be able to stick with that. And so, as I said, for the person that, you know, has a habit or taking the case of addiction, that to keep their stress down and stay in recovery, they have to. They may have to cut loose their old friends. They might have to change their neighborhood, and they certainly would have to change the way they go to and from work or to the gym, because otherwise it would re-trigger those parts of the brain. It would light up, and you know, eventually that habit would uh, start up again. Hi, I'm Dr. Robert Wright, Jr., the Stress Relief Doctor, co-host of the Learn to Live Stress-Free podcast series. I'm an author 
speaker, and stress management wellness coach. My published study is the first to show the connection between stress reduction, grief recovery, nitric oxide spiking, and the relaxation response. And my practical application of this knowledge helps you relieve the stresses of everyday life. I have the tools to dissolve your pain points quickly and effectively. Email me to find out how you can start to feel better now at stressfreenow.info forward slash contact. That's stressfreenow.info forward slash contact. Have you been procrastinating about completing an important project or pursuing a treasured dream? Christine Wright specializes in helping her coaching clients to lay out clear, elegant strategies. She shows you how to quickly build your confidence to uncover and eliminate your habitual patterns of resistance and self-sabotage. Christine helps you discover those meaningful insights that will get you to do what works so you can celebrate your successes. Go to stressfreenow.info forward slash contact to let Christine know that that you're ready to live your ideal life now. Again, that's stressfreenow.info forward slash contact. Welcome back to Learn to Live Stress-Free. And it's interesting that you talk about habit because I, I found that that's the key is changing your habit or adding other habits. So, so what... We do what our what you know. I'm sure audience members are do and and we do is we tend to get habitual about our problems, but then we forget that we can be habitual about our solutions. So for me, oh, I like that. I it, like that. You know, gratitude journaling became a habitual thing I do every night to reinforce that not every day is bad, right? Because I could. I was getting into a, a thinking style of everything's either good or bad, which is another common thinking style under stress, right? That everything stinks. I can't do this. I, I mean, all these, all these wonderful things we say to ourselves, and we we have to create habits that then change the bad habits, and that's what I found. You know, we we could talk about mindfulness. I know all day, but that's that's one of the biggies to me because your brain is is full of chemicals, and it does react. It's been proven. You know, if you sat there and read positive affirmations all day, the chemical balance in your brain will change. That's been proven. And it's the same thing writing a few uh, good things that happen that day. Even if it's as simple as getting up and breathing, that's that's going to change that chemical balance in your brain to uh, put it into a better uh, position to think. And that's really a, a key element to, I think, getting better, uh, you know, doing things that become habitual that are good for you, you know, whether that's nutrition, whether that's exercise, whether that's uh, gratitude journaling, whether that's talk therapy, cognitive behavioral, mindfulness, all the things that I know you and I, we, we both know work, but it's really up to the person because, one of the things that you mentioned is that idea that you can look back and say, well, my life's not nearly as bad as my mom's. But a lot of us, myself inclusive at one time, would say, but this is my life. You know, this isn't my mom's life. This is my life and the way I feel. And so how do you how do you deal with that? Well, what I found was uh, I volunteered. Well, I, I didn't really volunteer. I worked at a camp for children with disabilities when I was 18 years old. And you know who was disabled at that camp? I was. Who? They weren't disabled. They didn't think of themselves as disabled. I was the one who thought of them as disabled. They did everything in their power to do what they could do within their ability. And the thing is, they were worse off than me, right? So when you... What I find is when you when you do an activity like volunteering and you volunteer, you know, look at Jimmy Carter, what he was doing the other day. When you volunteer to help someone who has less than you, I find, and I don't mean this to sound wrong, that it's a very self-serving behavior because what it does is it allows you to go, hmm, my life's not so bad. <laughs> this person has it a lot worse and I'm helping them. And that that gets that, same idea as what you were saying with your mom that you can do, a lot of us have to, I think, help others in order to help ourselves. 
That know, was my grandmother. That was my grandmother. Or your grandmother, yeah. So, yeah, my grandmother. Yeah. So, you know, certainly well, my parents my parents had it much harder than me. Their parents had it much harder than them. I think that's a common story with many immigrant families or, or most families, you know, as, as life goes on, life's getting easier. I mean, my kids have it so easy, it, you know, it gets me upset sometimes. <laughs> you don't know how easy you have a kid, you know. Um, but sh- the but, shifting of the viewpoint gives a perspective that's helpful because what right. happens is it's easy for humans to get trapped in their own mind, in their own thoughts, and it's it's by sharing with someone else that you realize, oh, I'm not the only one who thinks this way. I'm not the only one this happens to. And I think this is what we can sometimes get into that causes us unnecessary angst. We think this is the only one this has ever happened to. But once you start talking to other people, listening to other people, volunteering, as you said, sharing, working with other people, you say, oh, these are universal things. This isn't um, all because of me. This isn't only happening to me. And I can actually do something to make a change. Because I think sometimes and we have talked about this before, and certainly you, Alan, when you are in the midst of despair, sometimes you just don't have the strength or the energy to reach out and to know that Mm -hmm. there's help. And Mm -hmm. um, as Bob often talks about, the catastrophic bifurcation point, when you hit rock bottom or when this is it, it's a a, make-or-break situation, that something happens to snap you out of it. And you say, wait a second, I don't have to stay here. Somebody just threw rope. I can pull myself out of the quicksand. But sometimes we're in such deep pain, we don't realize help is right there. And when you speak about the habits, when we start to develop that, when we can detach ourselves from our story, I know we've both had as a guest on our shows um, Reggie Mara, and his work is... Mm -hmm transcending your story. Yes, you know your story, but you don't have to be bound by it. Your story oh, exactly. is a thing of the yeah. past. You don't have to keep carrying it forward. I have a really funny story about, so when I was at the midst of, um, you know, and, and, and I'm honest with this because, well, when I, I, I wrote a book about it, but, uh, you know, I've had my cycles of problems, and I don't speak from the way I speak from anybody, anything other than I've learned what what I needed to learn, and now I share that. Um, but I remember I bought a book, so I would I would go to the barber, and the barber would put you know the little smock around my neck and, and snap it, and I would have a panic attack, and I felt claustrophobic, and I thought I am just crazy. I am sitting in a barber's chair trying to get a haircut. And I'm having a panic attack, and of course I'm doing everything to hide it. And what what is wrong with me? Like I have got to be the only person that has this problem. And I bought this book that was like a, a stress and anxiety um, recovery book, and it said in it. And some people even get panic attacks when they go to the barber. And he snaps the camera. I'm like, I'm just like everybody else. I'm not. I'm not. Christine, could you, could you, uh, Alan? I, you know, you. This, that is such a funny story. Christine, could you tell the story that uh, the 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 famous uh, coach, uh, Dr. Maria Nemes, tells about the the stress of seeing someone else writing oh. her writing her book. Can you tell that story that, that Maria tells so well? I, I don't know if I can do it justice, but Maria Nemeth always talks about she, you know, had it in her mind to write this book, and she kept putting it off and putting it off and because she said she's not good enough. She needs more credentials. She needs more information. And there she is walking down the street one day. She looks in a bookstore. There is her mm-hmm. book. Someone else mm-hmm. wrote her book. She went in, she picked it up, she looked, wait a second, he doesn't have more credentials than I do. The difference is he wrote the book. She didn't. Right. Yep. Right. And, 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 you know, is that, that, that... So, but you found, you found the book to say that you're not the only one who, who has panic attacks in the barber chair. You found the book. Well, and... Alan, I just want to jump in here because I want to thank you, you know, 
you send out a, a daily paperly. So I'm doing a plug for you here. Uh, audience, if you get a chance to click on a, a link that uh, Alan has on his site someplace uh, to sign up for his paperly, he sends out this daily paperly that has just fantastic resources on stress, anxiety, grief, uh, chronic pain. It, it's an eclectic mix. But, I, Alan, I want to thank you. The, you know, you were talking about gratitude. From your paperly, I had clicked on an infographic on your site, and, 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 mm -hmm. and what, it, what I'm getting at is that it gave a, an amazing statistic. It said, um, you know how um, it's talked about the uh, millennial generation, uh, um, you know, whatever they do or don't do, but they had done a study of, of teenagers between the ages of 15 and I believe it was 25, and they found that 95% of the teenagers surveyed, I think they surveyed maybe 3,000 people, 95% had done some random act of kindness in the last six months. So I thought that was a startling mm. statistic, the random act of kindness with no expectation of getting anything back. I think that really speaks to uh, a level of hopefulness, you know, because sometimes we can get kind of down thinking about, you know, where is humanity going? There's no hope, you know, you know, especially we see the way people are driving on the roads. In fact, I was commenting to Christine. I said my experience of being back in the New York City area is that, gee, it used to be like on Friday, you know, people were driving with wild abandon, but I said, today is Monday, and they're driving like it's a Friday, um, <laughs> Friday, 5 p.m., <laughs> if, that, if yeah. that needed explanation. And so every day, so I think part of the thing is that people are really, some people are really wound up tight. And I see people running across the street right in front of the bus. Of course, I think everybody's seen this with the people who are looking down at their phones and very distracted just walking down the street and, you know, maybe stepping out or not seeing a hole. And I, I think I mentioned this statistic on your show in our previous interview, Alan, that there was a uh, SUNY uh, Stony Brook study that showed that 10% of the emergency room admissions into Bellevue Hospital, which is a large city hospital in New York, in Manhattan, were due to smartphone distraction or distractibility. Mm -hmm. So I guess the phone is smart, but the, the users aren't always. But if think about that, what we're talking about, if 10% of the emergency room admits are due to cell phone distraction, that's very serious, you know, in a place, a congested place like New York. But I want to thank you again, you know, audience, uh, if you get a chance, Alan has some amazing infographics on his website. Alan, could you, could you give uh, people your, your website address uh, so that they could find you? Sure. Th thanks, uh, Bob. It's https colon slash slash bullyingrecovery.org, or you can just search on the web for bullyingrecovery.org, and it'll come right up. So... And from there, you can get to the paper. Uh, you can get to lots of articles, lots of research uh, that I've done, and all sorts of different perspectives as to how you can help yourself, really, and, and get help. Uh, one of the things that when I gave this presentation, I said is really, you, you have to consciously decide that you want to, to get better and change your habits and do these things. Like I know plenty of people that don't want to change their habits, that enjoy blaming the world for all their wrongs and, and enjoy, I, I guess, living in that stress because it's their excuse for their life. And so I said, you know, at the end of the presentation, I said, if you, if you don't want to get better, don't do anything. Keep doing what you're doing. It's working, right? <laughs> Uh, but if you do want to get better, reach out and, you know, whether that's uh, a therapist, a psychiatrist, a coach, people that you trust and know, uh, books like I read that told me, hey, you're not, you're not crazy and a lot of people go through this. I mean, and we, we, we talked about the statistics of stress earlier. It, it's, it's a very common issue and it's one that needs to be addressed because it's, 
killing us. It's it's literally causing physiological damage to our bodies. And I think that that to me was the most interesting part of what came out of my research was that it was causing that much physiological damage to the point where they could classify it as having caused, you know, 60% of illnesses leading to death, you know, illness and disease. That's that's a staggering statistic. Alan, I, I just want to give you another plug because, I mean, you're doing such outstanding work. In the past, you've talked about the talks that you've given in the public schools where you've talked about bullying both as bully and bully victim. And because I, I think that that's a unique perspective to talk, I mean, very f- infrequently would people hear, well, what's going on in the, in the head of a bully, Right. Because mm-hmm. because almost no one talks about that, you know. That's like talking about the the hyper side of stress. You know, it's very you don't hear about that that much. So, could you just talk briefly as we wind down? Can you just talk briefly about the response that you've gotten from the the both administrators and the students to whenever you've talked about the bullying? Because the bullying is not just that it's stressful. It ha- it can have long term trauma memory ramifications. You know, in your case, like you said, it, it causes anxiety, et cetera. But for but at the base of all this is fear, right? Yeah. Because when you're being bullied, yeah. the person's being is afraid. Right, because right. if they weren't afraid, they just they knocked the other person's block off. So, could you just talk about just briefly what are administrators uh, saying and how are they responding to your uh, message of hopefulness or uh, surrounding the bullying topic? Yeah, well, I just you know it's interesting you bring that up. I just got back from the University of Auburn's anti-bullying summit where I was talking to mainly administrators and guidance counselors and people like that and. You know, everybody else was presenting sort of the statistics of bullying, and I I was trying to present, you know, the personal long-term effects of bullying. And what was interesting, what I found in my session as as I talked to them, I don't think that that's being focused on as much as it should be. So, so what, one of the things that I talk about now, which I think many people are getting interested in is that we're starting to be able to identify uh, different types of personality or people traits. So one of the things that I've discovered recently is that I'm something called a highly sensitive person, uh, which is almost like being an empath, Uh, not Star Trek empath, of course, but... but, um, Oh, your name isn't Jem? What? (laughs) That, that's from the episode where she's the, the serious empath. That's right. Um, so so it's true. There's a, a books written. You know, I'm like, why? Why? And, and the way I discovered it was really interesting, um, which was that animals approached me more often than they approached others, including dolphins and all sorts. So all my life, like, animals have been very close to me. While animals are very uh, uh, keened on to high sensitivity, you know, it's kind of like people know, like, oh, if they're not feeling good or if they're feeling down and you have an animal, they tend to come up and, and spend time with you, you know, a cat or a dog, um, because they sense these things. So uh, I'm changing the subject a little, but but in terms of the long-term effects, I think that we're really on the cusp of the realization of people that we're not talking about youth having, getting bullied and then going forth in life and becoming successful, that it really, that that point in life is breaking them and breaking them to the point now we see, obviously, suicides on Facebook, on YouTube, on all of these things where where the kids are telling us it's bullying, and then we're seeing school shooting, school violence, all of these things that, that are caused by that breaking of that fight or flight instinct that we have because it can be broken at least that's my belief that that it can be broken by a bully or by people who are constantly putting you into that mode you know we we know it's true because we call it ptsd and war right if you're constant fear mode 
Well, it's no different in, in the world. We finally diagnosed it as co- complex PTSD or CPTSD, which is really just the same thing as PTSD, same results. So we know now, you know, this is this is the result of being in a constant fight or flight feeling is it breaks. It breaks us. And that's the part I think we need to now start to address more seriously. And I think the schools get it. I mean, nobody wants uh, a child to die at their school uh, in suicide. But worse yet, they, they certainly don't want kids carrying weapons to school. And the latest statistics show that about 40 to 60 percent of bullying victims uh, who are constantly bullied in school bring a weapon to school to protect themselves. Well, I just want to jump in here, Alan, because it it actually can be worse than that. We actually uh, met with someone um, not too long ago, earlier this year, who's a, a, a school teacher that told us of an example of bullying uh, where a teacher was well, it's 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 a complex bullying situation. However, uh, the teacher ended up committing suicide, and oh, yeah. so this is it's is you as I say often to Christine, you know, it's a tragedy and a travesty because you know it's beyond sad because now you got a situation a teacher commits suicide inside the school, and so what kind of um, grief recovery uh, for the people for. The, his class, her class, uh, it, it stays with a person for the rest of their lives. Well, and, and it's one of the most misleading um, statistics that I think we put out there about bullying, which is that the youth suicide rate is the second leading cause, I believe, of, of death in youth. Yes, yes, I remember high, seeing a statistic between, uh, I think, the ages for 12 to 24 or something like that. Yeah. But the highest level of suicides happen to people who are in their middle age. Hmm. So it's only because when you're young, you're less apt to have heart disease and cancer and other things. But the highest numbers of suicides actually happen to midlife people in their midlife, which I think is very interesting because that is a very stressful time when you kind of hit that point when you're like, you know, what have I accomplished in life or what haven't I accomplished in life? And add add on to that that you lack um, any kind of uh, good feeling self-esteem because of the things that happened to you earlier in life that maybe led to you not leading a life that you wanted. And and so I think that's got to be looked at too. You know, it's, it's long-term effects. It's not short-term effects. In the short term, it's bad. In the long term, it's really bad. And how many of us work with people that are not too much fun to work with um, who seem to have bad reactions, You know what I, what I call perceived threat syndrome in, in my world of, of, you know, once you've broken your fight or flight, everything's a threat. So, you know, you go to do something with a project with someone and you make a comment about their work and next thing you know, you're in a full-blown argument and, hoping that a fist fight doesn't break out, right? You know, it's like that, that there's people like that out there, unfortunately, who uh, we have to deal with and, and help try to get help for. And, uh, and you know, I think it, that that's very true, why it's so important to have ongoing stabilizing practices, ongoing practice that uplift us, because we'll find ourselves in situations where we may have a weak moment and we're with somebody who is stressed out or in a worse place than we are, and things can escalate. So I think that's why it is so important. And, you know, we, we, we try and mention that e- each call to have some practice, whether it's affirmations, meditation, open focus, something mm-hmm. that you have to stabilize yourself and to uplift yourself on an ongoing basis. Well, Alan, I want to say it has been wonderful spending time with you again, as it always is, because we just have so much to share, and there are people in pain and in distress who are really in need of the work that you do and that we do, and we're glad to be able to bring that to our audience. And, Alan, I want to end on this note. We we know a person, well, several people have have mentioned this, but one person 
in particular, um, June Davidson in California, who we've done a couple of podcasts with, she said something to me that in light of what you're talking about in terms of how to minimize conflict, a lot has to do with perception. So here's what I'm getting at. I have personally experienced over many years situations where uh, I thought that, you know, based on the facial expression or body language of the person, that they they were either up in my grill or giving me static or, you know, just giving me lip, <laughs> right? Okay, I'll just put it like that. And come to find out, now, now sometimes that is the case, right? Sometimes I, that I'm perceiving right. things correctly. However, there's a percentage of the time, and then this is like a sliding scale thing, when there's a um, an aspect of giving uh, people or, or the – benefit of the doubt. Now, there are certain situations where there should be no benefit of the doubt given. You know, a guy's coming down the street, he has a steel pole, and he wants to crack you in your skull. There's no benefit of the doubt there. However, it was pointed out to me, and this is, and I've seen this time and time and again now, now that I've opened my mind, and so that's what I want the audience to um, pay attention to, that Sometimes you approach a situation that can look hostile because you're misreading it. And so here would be an example. Uh, We were having lunch with someone, and um, I looked up across the room, and I saw this uh, waitress, and she had this horrible grimace on her face. And I said, oh, my gosh, what is going on with her? You know, And it turns out that the person we're having lunch, she said, oh, no, um, she had a tragedy where she was mauled by uh, um, a, a group of pit bull dogs, and her face had to be reconstructed. So that's what I was seeing, the reconstructed surgery. So it had nothing to do with the way she was presenting. That's my point. It had nothing mm-hmm. to do that she was angry or, you know, the way she was looking at us. It was she was doing the best that she could. Another example was I remember we were coming into a hotel and the uh, the guy at the door, he, he really wasn't friendly. And what um, what June Davidson said to me, he said, you don't know what could have just happened to that person. And the more I talk to people, Alan, I see that sometimes we are coming into contact with people. Someone just got a call. Uh, someone was in a car accident or uh, something happened. And so you don't know or, you know, something happened to them where, you know, it's their last nerve, so to speak. And then now you come into their space. So it has nothing to do with you. And And, and on the brighter side, I have been Uh, fortunate enough to say a simple thing like good morning or how are you to someone and find out the next day or the next week that they said, you know, you saved me. And I said, well, what are you talking about? They said, well, you said today's a good day, a good morning, and I was in a really low mood and I was thinking bad things about doing, you know, about hurting themselves. And so that has always been a shock to me whenever a kind word, just a minor kind word, like, good morning, how are you? Today's a great day. And that could actually shift someone out of thinking about suicide or or mm-hmm. some other thing of hurting someone. And so I want to say to our audience that whenever you can to look on the brighter side, and as Christine reminds me all the time, as much as we can to stay focused on the cause side of this the equation. Yes, stuff happens. Now what and what can we do? What is your solution? So I think we've heard this many times, you know, we can spend 90% of our, our time on the analysis, or we can spend 90% of our time on solutions. And I think that, that that gets better results when we stay on the solution side. Right. And and uh, I, I just want to say to you guys, we, we've been friends for quite a while now, as well as colleagues doing doing this work. And I so enjoy your perspectives and your knowledge. It's It's just wonderful to be able to hear uh, what you say, because, uh, you know, what it does is it reinforces me. For example, you know, my, my wife has a famous saying she always tells me that her uncle always said, which is, it costs nothing to be nice, but there actually is a cost, and, and you brought it up. And, and I talked to a, a, a one person who lost his son to suicide due to bullying who speaks around the country, and he told me exactly what you said, 
you know, a kid came up to him and said, I was going to go home and kill myself today. But you, you just changed me. You just changed, right. you know, and, and, right. and we have that power. Everybody does, not just you, not just me, not just this guy. And I do think it comes from, you know, that it doesn't cost anything to be nice, <laughs> but it can cost a lot to not be nice. And, right. Uh, so, 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 Alan, on that note, we can wrap this up to be continued. And we mm-hmm. want you to have, uh, when you come back, to bring your son and so that we can continue mm-hmm. that conversation. We had That's great right. fun. I believe your son is a paramedic, correct? Training? Yeah, he's Training? in EMT at, at an emergency room. And he, yeah, being an EMT at an emergency room, he, his job in many cases is to calm people who are stressed down. You know, through the way he works, because what's more stressful than being in an emergency room with a uh, something going wrong with you? And yeah, uh, yeah, he he'd be great. I, I'm sure he'd love to do that. So we'll do that again. Okay, so Alan, just tell our audience again uh, how they can get in touch with you should they want to work with you about any upcoming events uh, you may have. And um, I know you had a, a book that came out the, earlier this mm-hmm. year. Yeah, so I released a book called Crossing the Line, which is available on Amazon. And if you just type in Crossing the Line, Alan Eisenberg, it'll come up for you. Uh, It's a story of uh, teens that are taken to the limit with bullying and then take matters into their own hands, which does happen. And it's a caution, what I call a cautionary bullying tale. But also, you know, I have my website, uh, bullyingrecovery.org. I do speaking engagements uh, for all sorts of different groups. I write a blog. I write. I, I do a blog. I do a podcast like you guys, and uh, and I, you know, I love doing it, and I, I do it uh, again to really offer people that information that's hard to get in other places, but. Um, you know, I also go to Stress Free Now's website all the time to listen to your podcast and and enjoy what you're doing. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much, Ellen. Christine, can you give us a wrap from Learn to Live Stress Free Now? Audience, you can check us out at stressfreenow.info. We have our articles, we have our podcast, and you can just get tips on how to relieve your stress. Just check out the website, stressfreenow.info. Yes, and audience, uh, on that note, I just want to uh, close mentioning that you can come to our coaching page. If you're looking to get uh, additional assistance, you can see uh, how Christine can be helpful to you or I can be helpful to you in relieving your stress, anxiety, chronic pain, or grief, and uh, working through other areas to be uh, more uh, proactive and to get things done in your day. So, audience, I want to thank you so very much for listening, and I want to thank you again, regardless of whatever time zone you're in right now. We so much appreciate your presence, and we have learned that our audience is worldwide, and we'll trust that you'll benefit in some special way from the information we delivered on today's show. Of course, as always, we look forward to and welcome your comments on our show. Please let us know if there are any additional topics you'd like to see us cover or if there's a guest you enjoyed whom you'd like us to invite back. Please contact us through our website with your feedback and suggestions. Remember, listeners, if you'd like to experience the same benefits our coaching clients get with us, including learning how you can get more results in your day and easy ways to dissolve your chronic pain, stress, and anxiety, then give us a call at 954-900-2179. Mention that you heard our Stress-Free Now podcast show, and you will receive a free gift from us. Call today to schedule your free consultation. For Christine Wright, this is Dr. Robert Wright, Jr. of StressFreeNow.info. Until next time, be safe and be well.